Hello and welcome to another episode of Flying High with Flutter. I'm your host, Alan Wyma. And I just wanted to say before we start the show that uh, currently at this company, this podcast is being sponsored by my company, Plangora, where we do uh, software solutions for companies in nearly everything. Uh, we also do training for Flutter and app development in Flutter. So if you need any help with Flutter, please feel free to reach us out. That's Plangora. So check us out at plangora.com. Uh, and next, I want to introduce my guest, Ben Hills. Ben is a software developer uh, living in, I think, in UK, it must be. And um, he made the Anytime Podcast Player. And actually, I've been bugging him for quite a while to come onto the show. And I'm glad he finally came around after much nagging. Many Was it two months, three months I've been nagging you? Uh, yeah, I know. But I've been a bit disorganized. But yeah, got there in the end, didn't we? Anyways, uh, yeah. So he's on here to kind of talk about his podcast player, which I think is pretty cool. And uh, I think your player is definitely inspiration for me because I'm interested in putting a podcast player onto the website. Excellent. So maybe you can kind of talk more about who you are and kind of what's your background. Okay, yeah. So like I said, yeah, so my name's Ben Hills. I'm from the UK. Um, I've been in IT for a while as a developer for on about 25 years now. So I've been around a while. Um, my day job is I'm a full stack Java developer which is you know, my day job. But outside of that, I you know, have an interest in mobile apps. Um, and, and so, yes, and so I've built this Anytime podcast player, a podcast player built with Flutter. Um, and I've been working on it for a, you know, a couple of years now. Um, I sort of first discovered the Dart language, I think it was about 20, 2015, uh, when it was still you know, um, aimed towards being a sort of a, a web development system more of a JavaScript replacement about a month before I think Google decided they were going to drop having, you know, Dart as a VM in the browser. And then I, after that, I sort of came across the, the Flutter language and decided I wanted to, you know, build an app. And I've always had a real sort of keen interest in audio and podcasts. And so I sort of got around to building the Anytime Podcast Player app. Yeah, but that's, that's quite an endeavor to get into, right? I mean, because there's a lot of stuff involved with podcasts. Like, uh, to be honest, I've been trying to look into, to look, actually, I was interested in doing something similar a while back, but uh, my, my main complaint is I want to keep my website HTML, but then just embed the player yeah. into the site. Because, like, for all of these podcasts, like hosts, the ones that actually host all the files for you, their players that they give you are not that nice. You want something a little bit more similar to your brand. So that's why I was considering to do something with Flutter, but... I don't want to do my whole website with Flutter yet. No, I don't know. I don't know if going to Flutter web's yeah, quite there yet. So, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I've always had an interest in, in, in podcasts, and I thought for some time about you know, building a podcast app, but I kind of sort of put it off for a while because you know, there are so many podcast apps on the, on the app stores, and I, just, you know, I couldn't decide you know, what I could do that would be different to make it worth doing. But then after discovering Flutter and thinking, I, you know, I really want to build something meaningful with it and perhaps something a little bit um, di different and that requires plugins because, you know, it's got your audio layer and that sort of thing. So it requires plugins to talk to the underlying audio libraries. Um, so I thought it'd be a good app to, to build. And I decided also I want to do it as an open source app um, to see what it's like, you know, putting your code out there. So I'm developing it in the open and, you know, getting pull requests and bug reports and suggestions um but yeah it's, it's taken a while to build i think i started i think i started at the beginning of what was it, halfway through 2019 um and at, and at that point i couldn't find any other podcast apps that were you know based on flutter like i think i found one um and so it took a while to get going because first of all i needed to build a library to actually like you said go away and find find the podcasts you know, a bit of search for them and, and download them. Um, and then having done that, I found that some of the MP3 files you get down with a podcast, it doesn't have like a duration in it. So then I had to go back and build a library to actually interrogate the MP3 headers to work out how long an episode is. So it, it took a little while to get going. Um, so I think well, beginning of last year, April time so was, the, was the first release. What is that called again, where it's like you, you go out to do something and then you have to do all these other steps before you actually do the thing that you want to do? There's a term for that. <laughs> I don't know. What would you, you... I want to say bike shedding, but that's not the right one. I, I don't what, know. I heard it yeah, but it was, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of groundwork initially because, I mean, the, the Flutter community is fantastic and there's lots of stuff on pub.dev, but there are still some errors that are a bit sparse. And I found things like um, 
you know, podcast searching or interrogating MP3 files was, wasn't there. So yeah, so I had to do that first. Yeah, but I don't, know, I don't know what you'd call that, what the term is, but yeah, there was a bit of grain work before I could actually start building, you know, the UI and, and the app. And I, and I put those bits, once I've done the grain work, I thought I'd put those out as separate libraries as well so other people can go ahead and use them. Um, so they're both on pub.dev. By the way, I know the term now. The what term is, is called yak shedding. Yak shedding. Yeah, oh, right. Not heard of that one often. Really? Is it? No. Yeah, it's called yak shedding. From? Does it say? Uh, probably from when you shed a yak. I don't know. <laughs> I, I know I heard this term before. It just popped in my head. Because I hear about this a lot because I'm also doing um, the uh, Rust podcast for Rust Station Station. I hear some episodes, try to get one out. Oh, yeah. yeah, yak shaving. Um, so not yak shedding, sorry, yak shaving. Um, uh, basically, right, okay. so shaving a yak means performing a seemingly endless series of small tasks that must be completed before the next step in the project can move forward, which is basically what you were talking about. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I can yeah. understand that. Don't confuse that with bike shedding, which is just basically we fight about nonsense. You know, should this, should this, you know, should this bike shed be red? Should it be green? Should it be blue? And you get stuck in kind of nonsense. That's the difference between the two. <laughs> yeah, all these new terms I'm learning. I have to remember those. Yeah, I thought you were the OG. I feel like I'm, I'm catching up on stuff that is quite <laughs> it's common in my circles at least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe maybe it's my age. I don't know. I'm not come across these terms. Yeah, but I like to kind of dig more into your background, right? Because you've you've been around a while. Sure. Um, kind of like when? What was your first start into programming? Actually. Oh God. So yeah. So I sort of discovered computers. I think it's sort of what, what the tail end of the UK home computer boom. So sort of early to mid eighties. So after harassing my parents, I was given a. a uh, Sinclair ZX Spectrum, a very popular computer at the time in the UK. You know, it's one of these plastic boxes that you plug into your TV with an RF lead and you've got a tape recorder for loading and saving software. And it came with a little manual. And in, and in the manual, there was, there was a section on on BASIC. Um, it, had, you know, it had some little programs in there, how to display your name or do some little tiny graphics on, you know, on your little colour television or black and white television. And... Um, yeah, and from following that, that was, that was it. I was, I, was, I was hooked on coding. And also back then, there used to be sort of weekly magazines you could buy. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you remember this, but there's one called Input Magazine. And inside it had little tiny projects and then listings for like the computers of the time, like the Spectrum and the Commodore. And you could, you know, occasionally you could buy newspapers and they'd have listings in there in basic. So that's, that's what really got me started in coding. So as well as, you know, playing games like my mates did, I would also spend a lot of time doing silly little programs in basic, trying to uh, eke out little bits of graphics and stuff. Um, and yeah, I've been coding ever since, really. What, so, but I, maybe I, I missed it, but like, what was it like that Bob Cures that got you so interested that you asked your parents to get you one? What, what was the thing exactly? I, ca- like, I why? can't remember. Just, I think it's just because it was at the time, like I say, because that, that time it was sort of computers were everywhere. There's lots of these home computers like the Spectrum and there's, Commodore 64 and the Dragon, they're all popping up. There's these hundreds of different types of home computer. And I can just remember having this computer book, which I've still got a copy on the shelf here, actually, in fact, where and inside it had about, I don't know, a dozen of the home computers at the time. I and mean, it's like two page and have a bit of information about the computer and then, you know, a picture of it with its lid off or the electronics inside. And I just found that fascinating about this little box you could buy, you know, hook up to your TV and start doing stuff with it. And when, you know, when I discovered it came with a manual with some basic and I just started typing it in and then you, I think it's the, it's the joy of typing a load of instructions in the computer and quite often getting it wrong, hitting the run button and it does something and you've got that sort of reward of, you know, I spent the last 10, 15, 30 minutes doing this little bit of basic and it does something. And then of course you take the listing that's in the, in the manual and then you tweak it and see, you know, what, what happens if I do this and what happens if I change that? I think that's just how I got the book and I've just not stopped coding since. And then, yeah, it took, um, took, co- took coding at school, did, uh, I think it was it Turbo Pascal, I think it was back then, the old, another old language. And um, yeah, I just followed it through and I've, you know, I've been a professional coder for, yes, yeah, so about 25 years and, and then still doing these sort of hobby projects on the outside, like, you know, the podcast player and other, other things. Okay. Um, so you start off, I think you said uh, you had 
Name quite a few languages. And what was the first language exactly that you started working with? Was it basic? Because that's what I always hear people talking about. So I think so the, 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 fir- the first language basic, yeah, because all these, all these home computers mm-hmm. would have basic stored in a ROM on the machine. So you just, you know, you switch it on, you get a little flashing curse at the bottom of your TV, and you could just start coding. Um, so I did that. I think I did dabble with machine code, but it just was beyond me. And then, yeah, and then it was Turbo Pascal uh, was, I think, the next the next language I learned. And then I started, I think it was about 95, I got my first coding job, and that was with, that was with a, a, a language called Sea Change, which is a, built in the UK. And that was, you know, I just sit in a desk with a, a dumb terminal with an orange screen linked to a server somewhere in the back room by a serial cable, and we'd sit and fight code all day with, with VI. Um, and then eventually I worked my way up through to, to Java, which is what most of my sort of coding career has been in, in Java. Um, but outside of that, I'm, what I'm enjoying most, I think, with, with Dart and Flutter is it just, it's just enormous fun. I'm having a lot of fun building this app, and it's, um, it, it's so quick to get stuff up on the screen you know, with a hot reload, change something, and, it, and it's there. It makes... Uh, it makes it a little more enjoyable than having to sit and wait for a build for three minutes. So yeah, I've done I've done a few languages, either professionally or personally, but uh, I'm certainly really enjoying Dart and Flutter at the moment. I have a lot. So you're saying Dart and Flutter is basically your favorite, or are you just saying it because we're on the Flutter podcast? <laughs> it's certainly I've I still got I've still got a soft spot for Java because I've been doing it for a long time, and even though it is quite old, and it's a little bit clunky, it's still been developed and still. I still use it every day and still enjoy it, but my sort of yeah, my fun outside of that is is Dart. I think I don't know. I think when you pick a language, sometimes it can just you know click. You try it, and when I first tried Dart, I thought, oh, this is this is good. I'm quite enjoying this. Um, but for other people, that might be JavaScript, or for other people, it might be you know Rust, um, or it might be Kotlin. And you know, and I and I've tried Kotlin, it hasn't quite gelled with me yet. But a lot of people rave about it. But I think certain languages just you just sort of click with and enjoy. Um, and, I'm, and for me, that moment that is dark. And I think also as well the fact that it's it's been developed and it's progressing quite quickly. You know, like I said, when I first started trying it, and I think it was about 2015, it was very much a sort of JavaScript replacement. And that was, you know, what Google was aiming it towards. And they used to have a, you know, a VM, a Dart VM in their sort of Chrome browser, so you could write Dart code directly into it. But it's now progressed into this sort of more sort of generic language and sort of enhanced to work with Flutter. And yeah, and for me, it's it's a it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I I know I learned Java like a long time ago, but I don't know. Just recently, when I try to use Java, I just feel it's too difficult, too out there. But I think Dart is a great mix of like JavaScript and Java, with like the way you know you have your your strong types, but at the same time, you can still be dynamic. You can still do some uh, classes and inheritance before. Now that they always have classes within JavaScript, but I mean like. You know, if you compare to old JavaScript, right? There was no such thing as classes. It yeah. was object or the we call it prototyping. Yeah. I think I think Java's fine. I think they need to speed up and get rid of some of the old stuff. They seem to be incredibly slow at they seem to they seem to deprecate stuff, but then never get rid of it. So yeah, so I suppose in comparison, Dart is it just feels sort of lighter and fresher and, and not as bogged down with, you know, twenty five, twenty six years worth of, of code. I mean I, see, I know I understand Java's like don't break things kind of mentality because it's there's yeah. a lot of stuff written in Java, right? But Dart has been able to kind of make some changes, right? I think they've been more adding things on rather than breaking things. But with this, you know, null safety, that's there's a there's a process to it, right? There's a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, inevitably things still still break. I mean, you get a new release of Flutter and it says, here's, you know, Flutter 2.8, go away and rebuild. And, you know, you try it and straight away something fails because, you know, one of your dependencies relies on something else that isn't ready for it yet. So with any language, it's going to break and you get a new release. But on the whole, it hasn't been too difficult to then, you know, patch it to bring back up. It just all depends on how many dependencies you've got in the in the pipeline, I think. Um, but yeah, I did find it interesting. You, you talked a little bit in, your, in the question sheet that I gave to you. Uh, about kind of how you got into Dart, right? You went to Dart first instead of going to Flutter first, which I think is less common. It, it happens, right? Because Dart's been around for a while. Kind of like, how did Dart get on your radar? I mean, you're just kind of chugging along with Java and all of a sudden 
<laughs> I was trying to think about that. I, it, I know I had a project coming up at work, and I was looking at, um, I was looking at Angular as the sort of the, the framework to use. And I think I don't know if about the time, but I think when I looked into Angular, that the, at the time there were three versions of Angular. So it's the standard Angular, which is TypeScript. Angular JS, which is legacy, and then this thing called Angular Dart, and I thought, you know, what's this? What's what's Angular Dart? I've got no idea what it is, and I think that's probably how I came across Dart as a language via just, you know, what is this Angular Dart thing? Um, and so yeah, so I picked it up as a language, you know, bought bought a bought a book, tried it out, um, and yeah, it was very much focused as a web language, and Angular Dart was it was okay, but it didn't have the sort of community and support around it. So I never actually used Angular Dart, but, I, but because I found Dart language really interesting, I sort of kept, kept just playing with it really. And then I discovered on YouTube that video from Eric Seidel, this, the Sky demo. So, you know, before Flutter was called Flutter, it was, back, it was a Sky demo. It was a very early demo of, uh, of using Dart to build an, an app, in this case on Android. And I think the video was already a bit old when I discovered it. So when I looked up, you know, the, the Flutter project, um, I thought it was really interesting and gave it a go. And, and back then it was still, you know, at a really early alpha, but surprisingly stable. So I just kept, you know, chipping away at it and learning it. And then I think it was in, I think it was 2019, uh, the Flutter team announced a thing called Flutter Create, which was, you know, create a usable app in Dart with no more than 5k of code. You know, and that was sort of the competition. And I thought, well, that sounds great. That sounds really interesting. You know, again, coming back from a time from computers like the Spectrum, where, you know, you buy a computer, it's got like 1k or 16k or 48k of RAM. To have this challenge of building something in 5k was quite interesting. Um, the, the rules did say that you could use third-party libraries but I thought, no, that's not, not much of a challenge. I thought, let's, let's see if I can actually build something with no third-party libraries in just 5K and you know, see what you can do with it. And so I built a little game uh, I called Dash Run, which is really sort of loosely based on the old Centipede game, you know, the Atari Centipede game, where you've got the little things coming from the bottom, top of the screen. So I created a game like that. So you had these 20... You know, dash character that would scroll from top of the screen, and you were a little character at the bottom of the screen. You tap the screen, it would throw something at them, and you had to try and you know knock them off, knock them off the page. And each time you completed a round, it would get faster and faster and faster. And so I managed to do that in I think I had about six bytes free, so I did it just under the five k limit. Um, and that was sort of the, the first real thing I built with Flutter, and it was just you know great fun this challenge trying to build you know a use a, a actually usable mobile app in 5k was was good fun didn't really go anywhere i got some nice tweets from the from the flutter team but it was just did it for fun um but i think really that experience of building something useful and having a lot of fun with it was what was then they would decide well, actually yes go back and revisit doing you know building a podcast player and so that's what when i sort of started to look seriously at building a you know podcast player in, in in Flutter. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's quite an endeavor, right? Like, what were your first steps when you started to make this podcast player? Because, I mean, you, I think the first step has to be some kind of research to see, like, is it even possible, right? I mean, it must have been your first thought. Yes, it was. So the first thought was, is there any other podcast player out there built with Flutter? And I think that's where I first started, just to get an idea what was going, you know, what was around. Um, and obviously, it's, it's quite difficult to tell if it, from a compiled app if it's built in Flutter. But I found one other app out there in open source built with Flutter. So I thought, well, it must be possible then. Someone, someone's done it. And then I started digging around on, on Pub, looking at libraries. And like I said, the, the, the libraries for actually doing the searching and the parsing of the feed didn't exist. Um, and similarly for the, uh, re, you know, reading the MP3 headers, that didn't exist. So I had, you know, a few days looking at the MP3 header spec and going through and, you know, writing this library against the spec and firing MP3 files at it until I got it match. And uh, similarly with the podcast searching, I dug into the um, Apple iTunes API initially because that's the biggest, or well, certainly it was then the biggest sort of index of podcast feeds. So then it's again, you know, spend some time looking at the iTunes API and, and building this library to start fetching the data. Um, 
and then again looking at the sort of the, the RSS spec. So, you know, a podcast feed is an RSS file, so it's an XML file of a certain format. So it's, again, it's just it's, it's a lot of sitting around looking at specs and stuff, looking at how it works to start building out the library. Uh, so that's my initial start with that. And then I found some really good audio libraries on Pub. Um, one called Just Audio, which is a, a library that can talk to the underlying player on the platform. So on Android, that's going to be ExoPlayer. And I think on iOS, I think at Apple Core Media. Um, and the guy also had another really good library that could extend that to allow you to run stuff in the background. Is one of the trickiest bits with a you know with a podcast app and click with Flutter, you know, single threaded, is that you know you turn the screen off, thread goes to sleep, which is not really ideal for a for a podcast player. So this those those two libraries are really you know sort of a core part of the application to allow you to actually play audio, not only when the app's out but also in the background, you know, even from the lock screen. So that's sort of I think that's really where I started with the you know processing the feed, reading the MP3s, and getting and starting to build out the audio library. And then, then after that, you can start looking at sort of UI and stuff. Yeah, I, for, the, for the plugins, right? Like, is, are you actually able to do all this using Dart? Or, can you, or do you have to actually farm out to C or farm out to the native platform to start reading all the MP3 data? The MP3 data, because I, I only need to really need to read the headers for the, actual, for the, the bit I need, the reading the headers. You can do it's some pure Dart, so it just you know just standard standard file I/O, read X number of bytes, which you know is the header, and then start pulling about the individual bytes that map out the length and um, other information that's within the MP3 spec. To actually play audio, you need yeah you need to talk to the underlying audio layer. So again, yeah, ExoPlayer, Apple Core Media, and so I'm using a couple of plugins. This just audio and audio service. Um, you know, which, which is a plugin, so a mixture of dark code and, and native Java, native, I don't know, Swift, I guess, for the iOS side, that actually then talks to the underlying stuff. So certainly everything that I've written for the app is all Dart, but it does use a few plugins um, that has to use native code for you know, audio playback and things like, you know, file permissions. So can I get permission to the device to save MP3 files that you can listen to your audio offline later? Um, and that sort of thing. So it does use a, does use a few plugins, but yeah, all, all my code is just, is just Dart. I've not I've not really delved into uh, plugin building just yet. But uh, okay, and then to make the player work in the background, like I I know there's a couple of libraries out there that can do this for you, but which one are you actually using? So Audio Service is the one I'm using, um, and so that well, it's, it's changed recently, so that will uh, spin up a background isolate. And then you communicate with the library via messages so that when the, so when either you press the home button and the main isolate is suspended, um, this background isolate can keep running. And similarly, when this, you know, if the screen's off, it can, it can keep running. Um, yeah, so that's, I think that's one of the key plugins, this audio service one. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I know. Like, I really liked your project too because I was actually looking for something in Flutter before, as I said, and actually I was kind of looking at because I was like, well, how did you do this and how did you do that? And that's why I like that you made it all open source, right? I'm guessing a lot of people must have like reached out to you and said, hey, uh, you know, thanks for making this because I really learned a lot and I learned how to do this kind of stuff, right? People must have given you that kind of feedback, I think. I've had a little bit. Of I've had a few stars, not a lot. Of, I haven't. I have to, in all honesty, I haven't. I haven't really pushed it or promotion wise yet because I'm trying to. Because I'm developing it in the open, um, and it is, you know, it's very much a usable podcast app. There are there are still some things that I would like to get in there, to to, to polish it off before I really start saying here you go is a complete is a complete podcast app. So it does all the standard stuff. You can you, know, you can you can search a podcast. You can follow a podcast. You can you can play. You can download. Um, but there are some things that are missing, things like there is, there's no queue yet. So that's the feature I'm currently working on is to add queue. So at the moment, you can only listen to one episode at a time. You, know, you play an episode, it gets to the end, and it, can, it, it stops, or you can pause it and come back later, whatever you want to do. So now I'm adding queue support. So that I think that's the, sort of the one thing left missing before I can say you know it's a fully featured, fully usable podcast app. Um, but yes, I do get people... Um, reaching out to me, I do get a few pull requests, a few comments, a few bug reports. So there are people that are using it and I, I hope it's, um, 
it's a useful app to build because quite often, you know, new Flutter developers come along saying, you know, I'm a new developer, I've done this, but where do I go next? Where can I, you know, where can I find an app to look at? So I'd hope that some developers out there would look at it and, you know, I'd look at it as a, a way to do it or perhaps look at it and say, well, maybe no, I would do it something differently. But, um, yeah, I do, get, I do get some feedback, but uh, hopefully I'll start pushing it a bit more when I think it's, you know, a bit more ready. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what, what people say. Uh, we have a question from the audience, actually. Uh, oh, really? Kyle okay. Austin asks, he asks, uh, can it connect to Google Drive for custom MP3s? It can't connect to Google Drive. Um, you can add a custom RSS feed. So if you've got your MP3s hosted somewhere, um, you can you can add you can add um, a feed because you you need a feed for it to know information about the podcast, information about the episodes, and that's that sort of thing. So if you linked to your, to your Google Drive just to play MP3s, no. But I suppose if you had an RSS file that you would built that points to your Google Drive, you could probably do it that way. But it but it needs that RSS feed to give it the information about you know what the podcast is, what the episodes are, how long they are, what the, what the title is, that sort of thing. It makes you wonder if maybe you should expand it to be an actual player with, with also podcasting capabilities rather than just podcast player only. We'll make it an audio player. Yeah, but then you'd have to support more than MP3, right? I think MP3 is kind of the, the standard format for most it podcasts. It is, really, yeah. Yeah, you might have started supporting, I guess, on a Flack or even just like MP4 audio, that sort of thing. So I think, yeah, my, my focus at the moment is just to try and make it a good podcast player. Um, and it's, it's definitely getting there. It does, it does have, you know, a lot of what you want. And I don't want to make it too complicated. I still want it to be, you know, straightforward and easy to use. But if I can just get on these, these extra bits like adding the queue, I think that's probably my focus for now. But if someone wants to take the source code and run with it as a, as a music player or as a, as a single-use application, it's all up on GitHub. So, um. You know, do take a look. But uh, how do you actually find podcasts, right? Because like, I know when I submit the show, I have to submit it separately to like Spotify, Apple, Amazon. I have to submit each single one uh, by itself to be discovered. So how do you actually find your podcast? So at the moment, it uses two uh, databases. So it uses the Apple iTunes database. So like I say, you submit to Apple via Apple Connect and it goes onto the database. The other one I use is a is called Podcast Index, which is a um, another database. This this I see this it uses sort of the open format of podcasting. So you have you know a search engine in this case, say Apple Podcast Index, and what that does it is, is a search engine. It just points to wherever your RSS file is hosted, and then the anytime player will go away and go look at the RSS field, RSS file, download it, and process the podcast. Things like Spotify. They are more of a close, close source, close shops. So they have their own format. So if it's on Spotify, you won't necessarily find it on any time if you've only submitted to Spotify because they do their own thing. They're proprietary. They're not you know, really interested in being open. Um, whereas at the moment, Apple still uses you know standard RSS files and the same with Podcast Index. They they point to your RSS file, which you could you know maybe use a hosting company or maybe you just host it yourself somewhere. And so, yeah, so when you hit the search button, you put in some keywords, it'll go away and search the database, bring back a load of feeds that match. And then when you tap on the podcast, it will then pick that particular RSS file from wherever it's hosted and, you know, pull it down and display the, you know, the description of the podcast, um, artwork, that sort of thing. So if, you, if it's listed on both sources, then which one do you choose? You choose one over Apple or you choose the other one? It's a setting. So I did Apple first because that's the one I learned about first. And his, historically, it's, it's the, the, sort of the biggest, biggest database. The podcast index has um, been around sort of a year, 18 months. Um, and I've added that one out as it is. Anytime I'll support that one. So you can go into settings and you can actually, at the moment, you can specify you know, which, which index do I want to use, Apple or podcast index. So it's up to you which you, know, you, know, which you pick. And that's only just for finding the, the searches. Once you find the feed, then you could just be checking those in directly, right? You don't have to go through the Apple. That's checking. right. So when you, when it, once it's got the feed, anytime we'll store it in its database. And then, yeah, next time you go in there and it'll refresh, it'll just go straight to the feed. It won't, it won't go to the index, the, the, the search engine. It'll just, it just uses the search engines purely to find the feed 
and then going forward it will you know it will just stick to using those those feeds and again if you if you know a, of a direct feed you can just go you know add feed and just type in the url and it'll go in and do the same thing go in and fetch it yeah that makes sense i heard some marketing thing out there where you can do something called a pop-up podcast where it's like a private podcast url where you can just point to it and then feed it in the url which is i guess what you're kind of yeah you're those about those video. are quite useful for things so it's so if you if you've got like a patreon for example so tell you what say one of my favorite podcasts is called darknet diaries for example and they do you know a public feed of podcasts but also if you pay so much per month onto his patreon you will get given a private feed which you could then cut and paste into the anytime you know add rss feed and that would give you your private feed, if you like, of podcast. I mean, it all works the same way, but this feed might contain, you know, extra content because you're paying for it. And so, yeah, so you can have these private feeds. So for things, yeah, for Patreon and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, okay. So let's kind of step back and, and talk about what we've, what we said. So you got just to the Dart, you took a look at Sky that kind of came up, picture interests. You took more look at Flutter. Uh, you're big into audio. You love podcasts. It sounds like because you, you mentioned another podcast on here. Uh, you decided to make a podcast player because it's really an interest <laughs> of yours. Yeah, and then in order to actually get this thing done, you started doing some. As we learned today, the word the word of the day today is yak shedding. So you had to shed a yak, or sorry, yes, shave no, a yak. Yep, I still got it wrong. Yak shaving. You had to shave a yak, and then you finally got it done right. So what was version like? What was the first version out there? Like like what, like what was your MVP that you kind of released? What was actually the feature wise? Feature wise, sort of standard stuff. And I tried to get it to be as fully featured as possible. So things like, yeah, searching, things like show us what the current charts are. Um, I wanted to make sure we have offline support because I know a lot of stuff nowadays is, is streamed, but quite often, personally, my podcast listening is perhaps when I'm out somewhere going for a walk. Or maybe it's in the car, or maybe it's maybe it's somewhere where I just don't have connectivity. So it was really important for me to put, you know, offline capabilities. Um, and then it does it does support some other uh, features. I think I had to put down my question sheet right there. Podcasting, podcasting 2.0 features. So it, it has features that are not supported by all podcast apps at the moment. So things like it can support uh, chapters. So if you have a podcast, you can specify a chapters tag in your feed, which can then break down your episode into chapters with a, with a timestamp. So, so a bit like, I suppose, a bit like you think of a music player where you have an album, you've got, you know, lots of tracks with an album, you can skip to whichever track you want. It's the same sort of thing. You can have chapters. So, you know, perhaps within, you know, an hour long podcast, there's, there's one section you're maybe not so interested in, or there's a bit you've listened to a part of it and you think, well, what did that person say? You want to go back to the beginning of that section. You can go across to the chapter side and tap that chapter and it'll go back and, you know, and it'll, it'll play from there. Um, and it can detect. So anytime we'll detect if your, uh, podcast has that support for this chapters, for example, and it'll, it'll enable it in the player. Why, why don't you actually, do you mind to, to show off a little bit instead of just kind of talking about it, maybe it makes it easier for people who are looking at the yeah, video. Yeah, sure. Okay. Our number one listener at the moment, Kyle Austin, is just made a couple of comments I thought I might mention to you. Oh, yeah. He's saying he's working on a Texas speech system to upload audiobooks. There are custom Alexa skills that take RSS feeds. This sounds like a solved problem, to be honest, but to embed the player in a larger system would be neat. So, I mean, I, I guess he's saying, like, maybe he right, can right. embed your player into some other things, if I understand correctly. Yeah, carry on. If you want to, want to give, give that a go, yeah, please, please do. Um, it'd be good to get it on some things. I've, I've had a little dabble with things. I did manage to, at one point, get it running on a, on a, on a fire stick. And I think that's one of the, one of the things about Flutter. It's quite, quite adaptable. So with a little bit of shoehorning, I could get it running on a, on a fire stick. Not very well, but it worked. But, yeah, so if you want to stick it on an embedded device... Fire Stick is just running Android TV or something, right? Yeah, it's it's a Amazon's version of Android, so yeah, it wasn't too much effort to uh, actually get it physically running. The, the the UI doesn't really work for a TV setup with a you know a D pad type thing, but technically, it, you know, you could go away and find a podcast and it would play. You know, so that it works, so it's certainly doable. So yeah, so it's a standard interface. I prefer prefer it on dark mode, it'll save my eyes. So. Yeah, we can do a search. We can do a search for, so flying high with Flutter. 
it'll go away, communicate with the API and find it. So it's got one match, as you would imagine. So let's go in. Uh, you get a bit of blur at the top. I must just say this is a development version because it's on my my laptop. So it you know this is not uh, production ready. So and then we can say let's follow it. So I'm gonna carry on watching it from now on. So yes, and then it will appear in your library. And your library appears here. So the more podcasts you add, you know, in here. So let's see what's currently running in the charts this week. There we go. What have we got? Let's pick something else. Let's pick a newscast. Really dull. And follow. And so yes, to display the comments here, it will display if you've got episode level artwork. It will display the episode level artwork here. So for example, Alan and yours. I know you have different artwork for per episode, so that should, as it renders, it will, hard to see on a small screen, but you can see clearly that it's got different images here. And we can expand that to get a little bit of information on the episode, or dig into the show notes if you want to find a bit more. And we can download it for offline listening, or just, or, you know, we'll just stream it. Um, so let's take another one. Let's take another one that I know has something like chapters. So let's see. So here's a one I like. So a, a podcast about podcasts. So let's follow that one. Let's just pick one. And yeah, so you can hit download. It'll just download it to local storage if that's going to work on this emulator. Let's just see if we can stream it instead. Then. If that works. Let's turn that right down a bit. There we go. Okay, so on this particular podcast, it should. Okay, so it's identified it as a you know podcasting 2.0 type podcast that supports chapters. So we can go over here and we've got a list of chapters. So we can then you, know, you can skip whatever section you want. So I want to skip the first few minutes, let's go straight into something about Spotify. And away it goes. And it will also, you can also have uh, different artwork per chapter. So depending on who's, how they set it up. And uh, let's try a different chapter. Different artwork. No, it's all the same artwork on this one. But again, you can scroll across the list of chapters or episode description and the chapter title. You can go across to look at the show notes. And then you can do, you know, sort of standard stuff. Play, play, pause. Skip, rewind, you know, change, change speed, do you know, volume boost, that sort of thing. Um, and then if you've had enough for now, I can just, you know, I'll finish, swap out of the way. And for each episode you look at, it will remember the position. So if you hit pause, it records where you are so that, you know, later on, you want to come back, it won't just start again from the beginning. It will, it will carry on where you left off. It's already better than the Apple one because that one I always have to re <laughs> flip around every time I close it. Yeah, again, it's the little things I really wanted to concentrate on. And a lot of people, can, like, when, you, when you look into podcasts, a lot of people complain, saying, oh, it doesn't remember where, you know, where it carried off. Why doesn't it do that? Or, or it only remembers the last one. Whereas this one, it'll remember, it'll remember everyone you've, you've, it'll remember every pause on all the podcasts you're subscribed to. And even if you just do a search and do a play without following it first, just you know, like an ad hoc play, it'll still remember the position, position of those for about, I think I'll put it at 60 days. So if you find it again later on, you can still carry on we left off. Um, and again, for me, that was quite important because I do a lot of flipping between podcasts depending on, you know, what, what time of day it is or what mood I'm in or what I want to listen to. So quite often I'll have several, I'm halfway through. So again, it was an important thing to, um, for me to add to, so you can always you know, pick off we left off. And again, uh, yeah, so here we go. So this one's, you can see a little, hard to pick up, you've got a little white bar here that shows how far across you were. So it's 100 minutes long, I've got 89 minutes left. So if I press play again, it should then carry on where I left off. And of course, this is a debug build, so the compiled version is, is you know, faster than this because it's taking its time. Yeah, it's, it's quite painful, but yeah, it's, it's looking pretty nice. I mean, you did lots of animations, which is good. It's very, very nice. Yeah, I, I've sort of taken the approach of trying to do, um, I was going to, to do, I mean, it's just taking a, a, quite a while to get to this stage, but I think I'm trying to focus on each feature and trying to get it, trying to get it fairly polished and as, as bug free as possible before moving on to the next thing. So yeah, so it might not have many features as maybe in the typical podcast app, but I'd like to think that the bits that are there, you know, are fairly reliable and uh, fairly polished. 
And again, yes, if I, if I minimize it, you should be able to swipe down and you still get your control up here like you would for any other sort of standard apps. You can, you can, you can play and pause in here. Um, standard stuff, the artwork. Kyle and I are both interested to know which, which kind of database you're using to kind of keep track of everything. So I'm using a database called Sembast, which is a NoSQL database. Um, I think it's from the same guy who does the uh, SQL Lite plugin. So it's a JSON-based database. And it's an in-memory database. So even though so the database is backed by JSON files, so as you write to it, it spits out to a uh, a file. But actually, the whole thing is held in memory. So you know, it has its advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is it's really fast because everything, everything in the library is, is held in memory. The disadvantage, of course, again, is to held in memory. So one of the things I have to be really aware of as I add new features is to make sure I don't increase what's in the database too much because, you know, everything you add to the database has been held in memory. Um, but it's, it's been really, it's really good. I can recommend it if you're looking for something, you know, different and not an SQLite based database. It's really easy to pick up. It's proved to be really reliable. I've not had any sort of corruption or crashes or anything like that. Um, yeah, and it's, 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 it's easy to use in the speed. I think that's what made me go for it. Surprisingly, you're using something like Hive or SQLite though. I'm curious why you decided to choose this one. I think again at the time, I don't think Hive existed back then. SQLite, um, I, I've used in the past. I, I just wanted to use something try something different and, and this one just appealed to me the fact that it is it's you know it's all in memory so I thought well, this is gonna be quick and it was really easy to use. And, it, and it's all written in Dart. There's no there's no plug in, there's no C in between, you know, in between some C library to device. It's all pure pure Dart. So it's very portable as well. So whatever platform that I want to push anytime to, I know that as long as it can run Dart, it'll it'll run this database. And so that was a, a real draw to it. Only disadvantage, and it's not just for this database, but actually with a lot of databases and perhaps a lot of plugins in general, is that I discovered that a number of um, plugins will only run within the main isolate. So even though you can spawn, you know, a hundred different isolates to do background tasks, you can't talk to the database in anything other than the main isolate, which I think for general apps is fine. But when you've got a, a, a a player where the main isolate might be suspended because your phone's off and you're trying to do some updates in the background, that can become a bit more challenging because, you know, the database is running the main isolate, the main isolate suspended. So, you know, so what do you do? So I do use a little bit of just writing to the raw file system. So when, you know, when things get suspended, I'll just write stuff to the file system. And then when the isolate is resumed, I can check the file system and say, oh, you know, what's changed? Um, but I think that applies to a lot of Dart plugins I've discovered, particularly databases as well, that you know, things can only run in the main isolate. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping at some point that will, ch will change, particularly you know, with these more lightweight isolates that have come with the latest Flutter release, where you can start spinning up hundreds of these things. It would be really useful to be able to talk to or, or have isolate safe you know, plugins for, for this sort of thing so you can store data from whatever part of your application you want to, rather than always having to rely on the main isolate, which is only available when your app's in the foreground. Yeah, th that's called um, shared group or something like that. I forget, something about the word group is in there where you can group isolates together and share memory. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm hoping, I've not really dealt, because it's quite a new, a new feature, I've not really looked into that yet, but I'm hoping that will start to improve this sort of thing. So we can have a bit more plugins that are, you know, cross isolate safe, I think. I have to take a look and curious to see what your findings are because I haven't had a need to deploy any isolates so far in my code. So I'm pretty happy about that, but I can understand that you may need something like that. Yeah, I've, I've used a couple. So things like, um, I do spawn up isolates. So when, when you pick up a feed, you know, this feed is, is an XML file and this XML file might be really short or, or if you've got like a, you know, a daily podcast that might have hundreds of back episodes, that XML can be quite large and it can take some processing to convert that, you know, from XML into dot objects. And so for things like that, things for processing or when it's calling the API, I do spin up background isolates so that it isn't going to make the UI stutter so that you do get a nice little spinny wheel to say it's doing something rather than it, you know, janking and jittering. 
So I haven't used a lot of isolates, but certainly for things like that, you know, fetching feeds, processing the background, I find them you've, you've got to really, otherwise your UI starts you know, jittering all over the place. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I know where they could be used, just I haven't had anything very intensive like that. Yeah. I'm pretty happy about. Um, cool. Uh, I don't think I have any more questions, right? I, I like that your library is open. People can take a look at it. You're pretty much open about what technology that you used and why you're using it. And uh, I can see you definitely thought out a lot of things. And the fact that you have a bunch of animations here and there, and you really focus on making everything as good as possible before moving on to the next is really... Uh, Great, great thing to have. Yeah, I've, I've, I've tried to keep it open. I've tried to keep the code layered so it's reusable. Um, I have noticed on the Play Store there are a, a couple of copies about, you know, so it's, people are using it. In fact, and there is sort of a, a, another sort of aside, if you like there is another project out there um, uh, that is using Anytime player as a basis of its own sort of podcast part of it it's app so this is app called uh breeze which is actually a a, a, you know, a a bitcoin wallet if you like um and they are actually using the anytime player code within their wallet as a podcasting section so that for podcasts that support it you can actually stream micro payments of bitcoin to your podcast while you're listening to it um, and that number is still, I think it's about 2,000 podcasts now that support that. So they are using the Anytime code as, as part of that. So yeah, it is, it is, it is all up there. It's all open. And uh, if people want to contribute or, or do something with it, yeah, it's, it's all there. That's, that's pretty interesting. I never thought about that. You could you put it into a, a wallet app. It makes sense, though. Micropayments. Okay. Is there anything else you wanted to say or mention before we start to, to sign off? No, I don't think so. Yeah. So um, if you want to contribute, it's all from GitHub. So it's github.com slash Mugga Java. You know, Java developers. So that's what the handle I've used for years. Um, or you can go and get the download the app at anytimeplayer.app. So yeah, please take a look at the code. Submit pull requests, bug reports, or you know, if you just want to look at it and say this, this code is good or this code is terrible. Any feedback would be greatly appreciated. And I think I just have basically just a few last questions. Uh, sure. Same questions as I have on the end of the sheet, which is basically, do you have any tips or tricks for beginners and also any kind of warnings for them? Tips, I'd say just start building stuff. Don't get too focused on state management and all that. A lot of people I see who are starting out are going, oh, you know, just, just discovered Dart and Flutter. What state management should I use? And I, just, and I think, don't worry about that just yet. Just download it, play with it. Follow the dots, flutter.dev, and do something, you know, start off small. Don't get too bogged down in things like, you know, state management and what plugins to use and what tools to use. Just, just, start, just start building. Because if you, I think if you start thinking too much too soon, you're just going to get lost and you're going to get fed up with it and probably give up and go do something else. And the other thing is, is just is, again, just build it. I think with my podcast player, I've been meaning to build a podcast player for a long time, but was sort of put off initially by the fact that there are just so many in the play store i couldn't think you know what can i do that makes mine different but really i don't think that matters if you want to build something it doesn't matter if there's a one out there or a thousand just just you know just go and build something have have fun maybe it'll succeed maybe it won't but you'll learn a lot in doing it so just just get out there and build stuff yeah i, I think i definitely agree you know the thing i don't really like and and i just talked to randall about this in the last episode which is People are always looking for like a map, which, you know, I learned about streams, what should I learn next? You know, what's, what's the roadmap yeah. look like? What should I learn next? And I think that's just the wrong way to look at it because there's too many things that you can do, but you're not going to actually do everything. Like if you think about all the stuff you probably picked up, how much of it do you actually use? I'm sure there's at least minimum 1% of the stuff that you've learned that you never use. But I'm also yeah. sure that there's things that you thought you would never use and then you end up happening to use it. You're like, this is perfect. <laughs> it happens yeah, a lot. Exactly. There's always stuff. I mean, like I said, I've been doing Java for years, but there's still loads of stuff that I've either forgotten about or I don't use. And or you know, you, th you find something new, and you think, "Oh, I didn't know about that. Why well, don't know about it?" So yeah, so don't get too bogged down. It just, just, just have fun, build something, and see where where it takes you. Your number one fan, Carl Austin, says that he's <laughs> lately treating coding, coding like a video game. You got to play to advance and make sure you save your game at checkpoints. That's that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Start start off small, keep at it, because yeah, otherwise you're just going to get fed up with it and disheartened and bored and and give up. And if you, you know, take it slowly, but do do something. 
build something that you would be interested in. So you know, don't necessarily go away and build another to-do app if that's just what people are doing. Pick something you're interested in and can go and build it. So in my case, I you know, like I say, I like I'm into audio, love radio podcasts. So I thought let's you know, let's just try and build a podcast app. And if you build something that interests you, it'll keep you motivated. If you just build another yet another to-do app or another UI clone or something, you'll you'll get bored. So yeah, a good, that's a good way of putting it. A video game, pick a video game you like and keep keep going. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, is there anything else you wanted to say, or maybe uh, anything, any shouts or anything like that? No, I don't think so. I think that's good. Yeah, if you want, just please take a look at the code and yeah, give us give us some feedback or uh, submit requests or or feature requests. Really, because I'm I'm building this in the open um for for because i enjoy it and for experience but also i want if, if people have got ideas for this pod you know why doesn't it not do this or why does it do that you know give me give me some feedback and then it might change the direction of how i build it but otherwise no awesome thank you so much for for coming on i really appreciate it um yeah I'm, i'll probably be stealing your your code pretty soon and, and doing something with it i'm still when i have a moment when i have a, a another hand then maybe i'll <laughs> get a chance yeah. to work on it yeah yeah, yeah. hopefully that's not too soon for it's uh or, or better but yeah. yeah yeah give it a go and let, let me know how you get on all right we'll do thanks so much for coming on thanks for having me on Alan. much appreciated